All right, welcome to the final lecture of CS285 that I'm going to deliver. We're going to have some guest lectures after this, uh, and an announcement of that will be posted on Piazza. Uh, but in today's lecture, which is probably going to be a little bit shorter than the previous ones, I want to talk a little bit about some challenges and open problems, uh, and also just discuss some uh, general tips and advice about uh, both using deep reinforcement learning methods and perhaps doing research in deep reinforcement learning. So let's start with some of the challenges. What are the things that are uh, quite problematic these days in deep reinforcement learning? Well, there are a number of challenges that have to do with the core algorithms uh, in DeepRL, as, uh, as well as some challenges that have to do with the kind of broader assumptions. So the challenges with core algorithms look something like this. Uh, stability. Does your algorithm actually converge? And related to this is the question, can you make any guarantees about what your algorithm is going to do? Efficiency. How long does your algorithm take to converge? How many samples does it require? How much compute does it require? And generalization. After your algorithm has converged, does the resulting policy, model, or value function generalize effectively? But there are also some challenges with the core uh, assumptions of reinforcement learning uh, methods that perhaps we may need to think about carefully if we are to be able to apply reinforcement learning to real-world settings. For example, is the basic reinforcement learning problem formulation actually the right formulation for learning-based control? What should be the source of supervision in reinforcement learning? Uh, and so forth. So let's first start with the challenges that have to do with the core algorithms and then we'll talk a little bit about those assumptions. So let's start with stability and hyperparameter tuning. Does your algorithm converge? Can you get it to converge successfully? Devising stable RL algorithms is very hard. Uh, and each class of RL algorithms has their own problems. For example, when it comes to Q learning and value estimation, fitted Q uh, or uh, fitted value methods with deep neural network function approximators are typically not contractions, and hence they don't have a, a guarantee of convergence. We learned about this when we talked about uh, Q-learning and value-based methods earlier in the course. So this is conceptually a bit of a problem, and practically the way that it manifests itself is that we have to work somewhat hard to tune the hyperparameters of such algorithms to get them to actually learn good, effective uh, Q functions and value functions. So uh, we saw before that essentially when you uh, perform the Bellman backup on your value function, you get something that is uh, closer to the true optimal value function in terms of the infinity norm. When you then project it onto the set of value functions you can represent, that is the set of neural nets, uh, you get something that is closer to V star in terms of the L2 norm. And uh, composing uh, an L infinity and an L2 contraction doesn't necessarily actually result in a contraction in any norm. Uh, there are typically quite a few parameters that such methods have for stability. So while they're not guaranteed to converge in theory, in practice it is quite often possible to get them to converge, essentially through gratuitous tuning and tweaking. So if we adjust the target network delay, if we adjust the replay buffer size, if we clip our gradients or use a Huber loss, or if we carefully adjust our learning rate, we can often get good results. Uh, and some of you might have noticed this in homework three. We gave you well-tuned hyperparameters, but if you tried to apply that algorithm, for example, to a different Atari game, you might have found that it was uh, not quite so straightforward. Now, I should mention at this point uh, that quite a bit of uh, more recent work has studied the degree to which this convergence is really a problem. And, uh, you know, as you might already expect, with very large deep nets, the non-contraction issue is not nearly as much of an issue in practice as it might seem in theory, because large neural nets can represent so many different functions uh, that in practice this projection operator doesn't change uh, BV all that much. So the non-convergence empirically doesn't appear to be that big of a deal, but many other issues do seem to be problematic and hyperparameter sensitivity, as far as we can tell, is with us to stay. And every year researchers are identifying new and new uh, explanations for the challenges uh, with the, uh, the stability of uh, deep reinforcement learning methods. Uh, policy gradient uh, or reinforced style methods. These methods have their own set of challenges. 
Uh, for example, the policy gradient, uh, gradient estimator, while a correct and, and unbiased estimator in principle, is in practice a very high variance gradient estimator, which means that you either need a very large number of samples or you need to carefully adjust your learning rates because if you have a very noisy gradient and you use a large learning rate, then you will not uh, actually succeed in improving your policy. This typically means that in practice, policy gradient methods require large numbers of samples, as well as a lot of effort to go into things like engineering baselines. So the important hyperparameters that you need to worry about if you're trying to use a policy gradient methods uh, would typically include things like batch size, learning rate, the design of your baseline, uh, whether you use a control variant, things like that. Model-based RL algorithms have a whole host of other complex design decisions that are important for stability. Uh, so, one of, of course, the, the first decision you're faced with when you want to use model-based RL is what model class you use and how you fit models in that model class. The particular representation for the model, whether it predicts the next state, whether it predicts uh, states k steps from now, uh, you know, the architecture of the model, whether it outputs a Gaussian distribution or some other kind of distribution, all these things turn out to be quite important for good performance of model-based RL algorithms. Optimizing the policy with respect to the model is often non-trivial. If you want to use gradients through the model, you have a backpropagation through time problem. If you want to generate synthetic rollouts through the model and then use a model-free RL algorithm on top of those synthetic rollouts, then you inherit all the problems with the model-free RL algorithms above. So that also often poses a major challenge in practice. Um, and there's kind of a more subtle issue, which is your policy uh, is trying to do as well as it can under your model, so it has a tendency to exploit the model. If your model is flawed in a way that allowed, allows your policy to generate uh, unrealistic behaviors that the model thinks are going to get high reward, then your policy is quite likely to discover that because it's explicitly optimizing for high reward. Um, so that tends to be a little bit of a, of a challenge. Okay, now of course, in this lecture, I'm not going, going to go into too much detail about each of these met method classes. We've covered all of them uh, in the past in this course, but I do want to provide some more general guidance on the topic of hyperparameters. So, of course, if you want to run reinforcement learning in the real world, you can't run hyperparameter sweeps in the real world. You can't train uh, your real world system 20 times and see which hyperparameters work best. Um, but you could consider using a simulator. Uh, you could ask how representative is your simulator. Well, usually the answer is that it's not that representative, but maybe it's representative enough to allow you to tune the hyperparameters of your algorithm and then retrain on the real system. Of course, if you're using hyperparameter sweeps and you're relying on that, and you're conducting all of your work computationally in simulation, you have to remember that the actual sample complexity of your algorithm is the time needed to run your algorithm multiplied by the number of runs in your hyperparameter sweep. Uh, which, in effect, you could think of as some other kind of meta-level RL algorithm which combines stochastic search over hyperparameters with gradient-based optimization. And in fact, some work has actually put forward this exact uh, procedure as an algorithm. Uh, oftentimes, these works use derivative-free optimization over the hyperparameters, kind of things inspired by evolutionary and genetic algorithms. Uh, we could also say, well, maybe we can develop more stable algorithms that are less sensitive to hyperparameters. And this is an active area of research, and if you're interested in how you can make an impact in deep RL, certainly developing algorithms that are less sensitive to hyperparameters uh, is a very uh, important and useful thing that you could do. So, what can we do? Uh, we could try to design algorithms with favorable improvement and convergence properties. Uh, for example, uh, some works have attempted to show, uh, at least under some uh, limiting assumptions, that the method can provide, for instance, guarantees of improvement. Uh, so I talked about one such guarantee when I discussed policy gradients, which is based on the Trust Region Policy Optimization paper. Uh, there's also work on safe reinforcement learning and high confidence policy improvement. Uh, if you are interested in this, you could, for instance, check out some work by Philip Thomas. There are also algorithms that adaptively adjust hyperparameters. Uh, for instance, the QProp paper by Gu et al., just to give one example, adaptively adjusts the strength of, a, of the control variant or baseline based on how well it correlates with the return. 
But more research is needed here, and oftentimes in deep reinforcement learning research, at least academically, researchers tend to prize improvement in asymptotic performance above simplicity and hyperparameter sensitivity, because improvement in performance is something that you can measure and print out and show in a graph in your paper, whereas improving uh, your uh, hyperparameter robustness and reducing sensitivity is comparatively harder to illustrate, right? Because you're you know, essentially comparing to all these other methods that have already been tuned to work really well. I hope that uh, if you're considering research in deep RL, you won't be dissuaded by this fact because reducing the number of hyperparameters, automating the process of tuning, and reducing sensitivity to those hyperparameters, these are extremely important directions to make deep reinforcement learning actually practical. So it's not great for beating benchmarks, but absolutely essential to make RL a viable tool for real-world problems. All right, next, let's talk a little bit about sample complexity. So what I'm going to show you on this slide is uh, a, a kind of back-of-the-envelope summary of the relative sample complexity of different methods. I'm going to start with the methods that require the most samples and end with the methods that require the least samples. So at the top, uh, we have methods that are gradient-free. We actually didn't cover very many such methods in the course, uh, but there are algorithms that will train policies with respect to reinforcement learning objectives that uh, do not require any backpropagation at all. They actually don't calculate derivatives through the neural network whatsoever, and they typically operate on the principle of sampling parameters using ideas inspired by uh, evolutionary search and random search methods. Then we have methods that are fully online, uh, like for instance A3C. Then we have policy gradient methods that operate in batch mode that sample multiple trajectories. So the distinction between these two is the fully online methods are going to take one step online on policy, often using multiple parallel workers to have a batch size of larger than one, update the, um, you know, typically these are actor critic methods, update the actor and the critic, take another step and so on. Policy gradient methods like TRPO or PPO will typically sample multiple trajectories and then update using a batch of trajectories. Um, then we have methods uh, based on replay buffers. So these are off-policy algorithms like Q-learning, DDPG, NAF, SAC, etc. So these are all methods that use some kind of Q function either by itself or in combination with an actor. And then we have model-based deep RL algorithms. Um, so these are the things that we covered in the model-based RL lecture. And then at the bottom here, I'm going to add model-based shallow RL algorithms, methods that are model-based but don't use neural nets, but instead use much more efficient but less scalable function approximators like Gaussian processes. Again, we didn't talk about this in detail in this course, but if you're interested in these kinds of methods, I would recommend for you to check out something like PILCO, for example. So as an example of gradient-free methods, uh, you have uh, something like evolutionary strategies as a scalable alternative for reinforcement learning. Um, this method is about 10 times, requires about 10 times more samples than the next method down on the list, which is fully online methods like A3C. Um, so uh, it's, of course, a little hard to get exact numbers, but uh, what I'm, the way I'm going to do this is for each pair of methods, I'm going to find similar tasks in the papers covering those methods and look at the number of steps that they report uh, that are needed to actually train. And if we look at the results in the Salimans paper, and we look at some results like Wong et al. from papers that use A3C and you know, various variants thereof, uh, we see about a 10x difference. So with something like A3C, you would need uh, on the order of 100 million steps, or the equivalent of about 15 days of re continuous real-time operation to learn the cheetah task. Uh, you would need 10 times that uh, for the uh, method in Salamans at all, the equivalent of about 150 days, half a year of continuous operation. Um, if we look at uh, TRPO for half cheetah, we again see a 10x uh, difference in sample efficiency. So it's a slightly different half cheetah. It's actually a slightly harder one. Uh, but this half cheetah requires uh, 10 million steps, about 1.5 days of real time. If we see... Uh, half cheetah in for um, off, off policy methods like DDPG. Uh, we see about three hours of real time. In fact, when we look at performance of DDPG, NAF, and other such methods, 
for real world tasks, like getting robots to perform various manipulation tasks, we can see that a lot of the methods can get you know, some reasonable results within a few hours. So that suggests that these simulated benchmarks like half cheetah you know, are giving us within an order of magnitude of about the right number. So again, we see a 10x difference in samples, off policy methods requiring about an order of magnitude fewer samples to get you know, somewhat comparable levels of performance. Now remember to take all of this with a grain of salt because you know, different papers use slightly different tasks and this is kind of over multiple years. So this is a crude uh, guess at best, but uh, you know, reasonable as an order of magnitude back of the envelope calculation. If we look at model-based RL performance, we again see a 10x difference. We see uh, you know, something like five minutes of real time to learn half cheetah with pets. Uh, this is a different task, this is actually Reacher, uh, but this is, this is a, a guided policy search style method. Again, we see a 10x gap between that and, in this case, DDPG. Um, so here we're talking about you know, training periods that are less than an hour long between 5 and 20 minutes. If we look at older work on non-deep, uh, on, on shallow model-based RL, we'll see another order of magnitude difference with methods like PILCO able to learn carpool and other such tasks with just a few seconds of data. Now at this point, of course, we have to be careful because once you go uh, to the model-based methods, both model-based deep RL methods and model-based shallow RL methods, you will also find that the performance depends drastically on the particular choice of tasks. In, you know, on the extreme end, the GP-based methods simply will not succeed in learning some of the more complex tasks. They have, in particular, a very harsh limitation in terms of dimensionality and in terms of the amount of data that they can use. So they can learn efficiently on very low-dimensional tasks, but on more complex tasks, they can't even use the amount of data that's needed to learn them, much less scale to that dimensionality. With model-based deep RL methods, you'll also see some trade-offs like that. You'll see that model-based methods will work very well on some tasks, but very poorly on others where learning a model is just difficult. So again, take, take this with a grain of salt, but if you have a task where all of these methods will work, you will see about a 10x difference in sample efficiency for each rung of the slider. Now, of course, at this point, you could also ask, okay, if this is true, why would I ever use the methods that are at the top of this uh, ladder instead of the ones at the bottom? Well, remember that at this point, I'm only talking about sample complexity. So when I say hours or minutes, what I mean is if the half cheetah was a real robot actually running in the real world and computational cost was negligible, how long would it have to run before it learns a policy? But of course, in reality, computational cost is not negligible. And the reason that people often explore some of these less efficient methods is because if you're training in simulation, you might be much more concerned with computational cost than you are about the sample complexity. And if you have an efficient simulator, like a very fast physics simulator, or if you're learning a task where simulation is trivially cheap, like a board game, chess or Go or something like that, then you might actually prefer the methods at the top of the ladder because they tend to be easier to parallelize. And when the computational cost is dominated by the cost of training the neural net rather than running the simulator, then the methods at the top tend to actually be faster. So the reason that something like evolutionary strategies might be preferred is because when parallelized across a large number of machines with trivially cheap simulation, it can actually learn policies faster. Of course, this might come out of heavy cost in parallel compute, uh, and if you have an expensive simulator, it's not, it's not viable, but if you have a cheap simulator, this can actually give you an answer faster. Uh, same for A3C. If you can have multiple parallel workers, you can actually require less wall clock time. TRPO can require significantly less wall clock time than something like DDPG or SAC if the cost of simulation is cheap. Off-policy value-based methods, Q-learning, DDPG, NAF, and SAC, tend to have higher compute costs. In fact, the most efficient of these methods tend to have compute costs that's comparable in terms of the amount of time required when training on a single GPU as the time required to generate samples. So for some of these robotics results, oftentimes the amount of time needed to run the robot is about the same as the amount of time needed to perform the compute. So this, of course, suggests that for the model-based methods, the compute time actually exceeds the data collection time even when the data is being collected in real time. Now, of course, computational costs arguably are easier to amortize. We can 
wait for NVIDIA to build better GPUs, or we can implement things in parallel. So those are, in principle, solvable problems, but we hit the break-even point around the point of these uh, replay buffer methods. So things below that tend to actually cost more in compute than they cost in samples, even if the samples are collected in real time. And following the trend, at the extreme end, the shallow methods like Pilco tend to be orders of magnitude more expensive computationally than they are in terms of the number of samples they need. So this notion of learning a task in just a few seconds is a little bit deceptive because the compute time you might need uh, could be as much as an hour. All right, uh, so but let's come back to the challenge of sample complexity and let's dig into this a little bit more. Uh, so one issue that comes up as a result of sample complexity is that you need to wait for a long time for your homework to finish running. That's, of course, a little bit annoying. But in the real world, it can make uh, reinforcement learning difficult or even completely impractical to do. So if you need days of continuous operation to learn a policy to, let's say, control a chemical plant or control a robot, it might simply not be feasible to perform that training process because it requires all sorts of safety mechanisms and human oversight during the training process. It precludes the use of expensive high-fidelity simulators. So maybe we do have a way to simulate some very complex phenomena using, let's say, a high-end finite element uh, uh, method simulator, but there's no way we can run RL on it because the simulation actually is slower than real time. That's actually a very common uh, phenomena with high-end simulators. And it greatly limits applicability to real-world problems. So it's an important challenge to try to address. What can we do if we want to deal with sample complexity? Well, we could try to develop better model-based RL algorithms. Uh, we can design faster algorithms in general. Uh, for example, in the world of off-policy reinforcement learning, there's been quite a bit of work with various tricks to accelerate DDPG-style algorithms. Soft actor critic is a very efficient maximum entropy RL algorithm that's also off-policy. And in general, there's quite a bit of work in this area. Uh, we can also try to reuse prior knowledge to accelerate reinforcement learning. And we can do this in a variety of ways. We could do this with something as complex as meta-learning, uh, such as the methods that I described in the previous meta-learning lecture. We could also think of reusing prior knowledge with offline reinforcement learning algorithms, like the ones that Averell covered in his lecture. So methods that can use prior data, prior knowledge, other related tasks, and other sources of data and, and, not, and supervision to accelerate the reinforcement learning process can do a lot to mitigate these challenges with sample complexity. All right, next let's talk about scaling and generalization. So part of why deep RL was so exciting from the start is that it held the promise of combining the ability of reinforcement learning algorithms to learn near optimal behavioral and control strategies with the power of deep learning to learn highly generalizable uh, models. So if you train a large high capacity convnet on something like ImageNet, then you will get excellent generalization to new images. But the difference is that a lot of these supervised learning tasks that utilize large data sets are large-scale tasks that emphasize diversity and evaluate on generalization. Whereas much of the research in reinforcement learning is rel uses relatively small-scale tasks, which emphasize mastery, meaning that the measure of a reinforcement learning algorithm is often not so much how well it generalizes, but the final reward that it gets. Just to get a, you know, uh, to give you a slightly hyperbolic statement about how this might not be the right choice, imagine that we were to evaluate an image classifier based on how confidently it can, it can classify one image. And we say, well, my image classifier is better because it gives 99.9% .9 confidence, whereas yours gives a confidence of only 98%. Nobody would care about this because the measure of an image classifier is not the percent confidence it gives you, but whether it gives you the right answer on new images that have not been seen in the training data. And that's not how we're testing reinforcement learning algorithms. So the joke uh, sometimes is that, uh, the, this is a joke that one of my colleagues, Adosha Efros, makes, is that, you know, reinforcement learning people, we always test on the training set. That's not right if you want to study generalization. So evaluating on performance is perhaps not the best choice if generalization is really what you're after. Um, so where is the generalization in RL, and how can we get it? Well, in a sense, RL has a big problem when it comes to generalization. The problem is something like this, that uh, in supervised machine learning, we have a, a fairly simple workflow. Uh, we, we collect data. We collect data from the real world, typically. 
And, but we only do it once. Once the data is collected, it's saved to disk, and then it can be reused many times. And then that data is used to train some model for many, many epochs. We can use a validation set to see how good that model is. And then once we're happy with the model, then we deploy it to the real world. In reinforcement learning, we have an agent that interacts with the world, collects some data, improves its policy, and then has to repeat that interaction. And this is done many times. Uh, this makes it a little bit difficult to utilize large data sets because if you want this agent to collect a large data set to update its model, it might need to recollect that data for every experiment. Even if you use an off policy algorithm, you would have to uh, typically collect some additional data with every experiment. But the actual reinforcement learning is even worse than this idealized picture because actual reinforcement learning also has an outer loop. And that outer loop is you. For actual reinforcement learning, the outer loop is the algorithm designer, the, the graduate student or undergraduate student, the researcher, who has to modify the algorithm, modify the hyperparameters, change and adjust things to make them work better. And this is an outer loop around this whole iterative process. So even if it was viable to run the uh, RL process many iterations on a lot on you know, large data sets, collecting new large data sets with every iteration, the outer loop the tweaking and tuning and algorithm modification makes us completely impractical. Um, so how bad is it? Well, take for example this video that I showed in the policy gradient lectures showing a, a humanoid robot uh, learning to walk. Uh, and you know, after a few hundred iterations, after here I believe it's on the order of 10 million time steps, uh, a few days, uh, the equivalent of a few days of real time, this robot could run on this infinitely flat uh, large plane. But if you want an actual robot to run, uh, you know, this, this six days of real time is actually a little bit deceptive, right? So you could say, well, all I have to do is just get a real robot to run for six days and it'll be able to run forever. That's really awesome. Well, not so fast because in reality, you might need to run on all sorts of surfaces. Uh, you might need to do more than run. Maybe you need to stumble and recover. The, the diversity of the real world makes these simulated results very deceptive. In the real world, these numbers will be multiplied by a large coefficient, perhaps many orders of magnitude, to account for the variability and the need for generalization. So the real world is not so simple. Now, off-policy RL uh, offers a reasonable alternative. But uh, again, we need to do more than just off-policy RL. We really need to look at things more like the offline RL recipe that Avril discussed in his talk, where we can log a large data set from past interaction and then only occasionally get more data. So this is really uh, going into the uh, territory of offline RL algorithms, especially if you want the tuning and algorithm design to be performed without having to recollect new data. So this is part of the reason why things like off-policy RL and in the more extreme case, offline RL are actually so very, very important. And of course, this is not just for robots, right? Uh, in many domains, all these issues that I mentioned are much more severe. If you consider autonomous driving, it's pretty easy to get a large data set of past interactions, for example, from human drivers. But it's very difficult to drive your autonomous car sort of round-robin style in all the different cities in the United States every time it updates its policy. Same, same story with language and dialogue. Very easy to get lots of data, very hard to get lots of online interaction. Other domains, operations research, finance, logistics, inventory management, all of these are settings where the uh, ability to get, achieve uh, effective generalization uh, hinges on, on large data sets, which are in fact available, but are very hard to gather actively online with a partially trained reinforcement learning policy.